She's, yep. she's raising some alarm bells as far as 2024 is concerned. She says she's terrified, her word, terrified about the election. Listen to this. What's going to happen in this next election? I am terrified about what could possibly happen because our leaders matter. Who we select, who speaks for us, who holds that bully pulpit. It affects us in ways that I, sometimes I think people take for granted. So when it, when it comes to rebuilding our economy, Barack is thinking about folks like my dad and like his grandmother. He's thinking about the pride that comes from a hard day's work. That's why he signed the Lilly Led Better Fair Pay Act to help women get equal pay for equal work. That's why he cut taxes for working families and small businesses and fought to get the auto industry back on its feet. That's how he brought our economy from the brink of collapse to creating jobs again, jobs you can raise a family on, good jobs, right here in the United States of America. Back in college, I was one of the few black students on my campus, and I was proud of getting into such a respect in school. I knew I'd worked hard for it, but still, I sometimes wondered if people thought I got there because of affirmative action. It was a shadow that students like me couldn't shake, whether those doubts came from the outside or inside our own minds. But the fact is this, I belonged. And semester after semester, decade after decade, for more than half a century, countless students like me showed they belonged too. It wasn't just the kids of color who benefited either. Every student who heard a perspective they might not have encountered, who had an assumption challenged, who had their minds and their hearts opened, gained a lot as well. It wasn't perfect, but there's no doubt that it helped offer new ladders of opportunity for those who throughout history have too often been denied a chance to show how fast they can climb. Of course, students on my campus and countless others across the country were and continue to be granted special consideration for admissions. Some have parents who graduated from the same school. Others have families who can afford coaches to help them run faster or hit a ball harder. Others go to high schools with lavish resources for tutors and extensive standardized test prep that helps them school score higher on college entrance exams. We don't usually question if those students belong. So often we just accept that money, power, and privilege are perfectly justifiable forms of affirmative action, while kids growing up like I did are expected to compete when the ground is anything but level. So today my heart breaks for any young person out there who's wondering what their future holds and what kind of chances will be open to them. And while I know the strength and grit that lies inside kids who have always had to sweat a little more to climb the same ladders, I hope and I pray that the rest of us are willing to sweat a little too. Today is a reminder that we've got to do the work not just to enact policies that reflect our values of equity and fairness, but to truly make those values real in all of our schools, workplaces, and neighborhoods. You, you make another point in terms of uh, uh, intra-black relations, and that is you say affirmative action for the most part has really benefited blacks who really didn't need affirmative action. Oh, there's no, affirmative action is a great way for black PhDs to get uh, endowed chairs. It's a terrible way for some kid in the South Bronx to try to get his first job. Um, what affirmative action does is create an incentive for people to hire those who have a proven track record, those who have degrees and things like that. Uh, it makes it more dangerous for the employer to hire an untrained un un uh, uh, person with no track record because if he has to fire that person, then he's letting himself in for, for legal trouble. In other words, you, you, can, you can hire a, a white of very doubtful qualifications. And if he doesn't work out, throw him out in the street the next week. You hire blacks of doubtful qualifications, throw them out in the street the next week, and you've got the NAACP, you've got the uh, EEOC, you've got God knows who all to contend with. The employers have long ago figured this one out, and so they have not hired those blacks who are at all doubtful, either in terms of qualifications or simply not enough experience to know how good they are. You see this in the data. Blacks who have education and who have experience have been moving up on whites and in some cases overtaking whites 
If you look at blacks who have not finished high school, uh, blacks who come from a uh, uh, background of uh, families that are broken and so forth, they are falling further and further behind, not only further behind the population in general, but further behind whites of this, with the same disadvantages. What do you blame for that? You're not blaming middle class blacks who are beneficiaries of affirmative action, are you? I'm blaming the incentives created by affirmative action. Because when it comes to the, the incentives that are created, the businessman is going to try to protect himself whatever way he can. And that means hiring those blacks who are overqualified, who have a, a long track record and so on. And that's what all the data show, that the more, for example, black couples where the husband and wife are both college educated now make more money than white couples where the husband and wife are both educated. But the black uh, uh, female headed family has lost real income in absolute term of terms over the past several years and has fallen further behind white female-headed families. So the very opposite trends are going on at the same time. And you can't argue this because of blackness or racism, because both of them are black people. One group is shooting way ahead, one is falling further and further behind. And a large part of that reason, I believe, and the data seem to suggest, is because the incentives created by affirmative action and similar kinds of programs uh, just make it too dangerous to take a chance. First Lady Michelle Obama. She begins by describing her father and Barack Obama's grandmother as decent people, hardworking people who sacrificed for her families. And then she says this. So, when it, when it comes to rebuilding our economy, Barack is thinking about folks like my dad and like his grandmother. He's thinking about the pride that comes from a hard day's work. That's why he signed the Lilly Led Better Fair Pay Act, to help women get equal pay for equal work. That's why he cut taxes for working families and small businesses and fought to get the auto industry back on its feet. That's how he brought our economy from the brink of collapse to creating jobs again, jobs you can raise a family on, good jobs, right here in the United States of America. President Obama is giving us, quote, jobs you can raise a family on. Tom? You know, it's, 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 it's like someone once said, it's like, it's like being a mosquito at a nudist colony. You don't know where to start. <laughs> I mean, we're not going to be in the air long enough for me to, to, to dissect all the falsehoods that this woman has put into those few words. Give us uh, one. Okay, the jobs that you can raise a family on. The new jobs that are being created are disproportionately very low-income jobs. So uh, I don't know uh, how, how you're going to be raising a family on uh, minimum wage type jobs or uh, flipping hamburgers at McDonald's. Uh, the other thing is that... What is implicit in all of this is that the economy has no recuperative powers of its own, that all the benefits, all whatever recovery there have, have been, has been due to Barack Obama. It's like that, the scene of Genesis where he's breathing life into the clay of the economy. That, that's it. That's it. Now, anyone who studied history knows that for the first 150 years of this country, the federal government did not intervene when the economy turned down. And all that time, the downturns all corrected themselves. One of the, one of the, most, one of the most classic examples was on the Warren G. Harding. Uh, when he, his first year in office, he found the unemployment rate at 11.7%. He did absolutely nothing. And he did not spend more government money. He cut back government spending. Uh, the Federal Reserve had the uh, interest rates up at 6 or 7%, not down at 1% where they are, are now. Uh, the next year, unemployment was at 6.7%. The year after that, it was 2.4%. So the economy has recuperative powers. I mean, employers have an incentive to hire people. Workers have an incentive to get jobs. Lenders so, uh, have incentives to lend. Is it your they don't need somebody in Washington trying to micromanage all of this. Your argument is not only weak form of the argument. Barack, we don't need Barack Obama to breathe life into the economy right. because it'll recover on its own sooner or later. If strong, Barack Obama stays out of the way. That's what I'm saying. The strong form of the argument is Barack Obama's actually been holding it down. No question. I mean, uh, th there's never been a, 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 a recovery other than that of the Great Depression of the 1930s that took so long. Uh, under Ronald Reagan, Reagan in the, in the early years got up to 9.7% uh, annual unemployment. Uh, he did absolutely nothing. The media went crazy. The unemployment came down, and it kept right on coming down. Right. All right. So 
common sense, use your head. One common sense question is, what went wrong? How did we get into this mess in the first place? And Bill Clinton, once again at the Democratic National Convention, explained the answer. Yes. In Tampa, the Republican argument against the president re-election was actually pretty simple, pretty snappy. It went something like this. We left him a total mess. He hadn't cleaned it up fast enough, so fire him and put us back in. <laughs> the Republicans created the mess. This shows that Clinton is truly a masterful politician. And to be a masterful politician, you have to have a lot of brass. And it takes an incredible amount of brass for Bill Clinton, who was the, big, who was the, the biggest factor in creating the housing boom that led to the bust that brought down the whole economy. Uh, it was during the Clinton administration that the federal government forced lenders to change their lending standards, which had been in place for decades and had made real estate one of the safest investments around. Bring those standards down in order that they can get the numbers that they want for low income, minority, et cetera, uh, mortgage uh, applicants. Barney Frank, the ranking Democrat on the House committee that oversaw Freddie, May and Fannie, May, uh, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae said, quote, I'm willing to roll the dice yes. on Freddie and Fannie, meaning he would, he would take, he'd be willing to take the chance that the standards were being brought down too low. More than that, uh, Attorney General Janet Reno under, the, under Clinton uh, threatened lenders with legal, with legal action from the Justice Department if their numbers uh, in terms of groups and then income levels of people who were approved didn't fit her preconceptions. HUD under, under Clinton uh, took, made loss, lawsuits against uh, lenders, uh, charging them with racial discrimination based solely upon statistics. So, so Tom, give me for the layman a three-sentence summary, a t sound bite kind of summary of what caused the mess we're in. It was not a failure of the market. It was a failure of... The government forcing people to lower, lower the in, uh, lending standards that had existed for years. Uh, and they said, well, the problem was blamed on greed. You don't satisfy greed by lending to people who can't pay you back. All right. Uh, you, assist, you insist once again that if we base this election on the facts, the Obama administration would be, quote, doomed. But listen to President Obama himself. Last clip from the Democratic National Convention. If you believe that new plants and factories can dot our landscape, that new energy can power our future, that new schools can provide ladders of opportunity to this nation of dreamers, if you believe in a country where everyone gets a fair shot and everyone does their fair share and everyone plays by the same rules, then I need you to vote this November. All right. New plants and factories, new energy, new schools, and a fair shot. What's wrong with that? <laughs> I, I, I wonder if the fair shot includes the taxpayers. But uh, we've, had, we've, had things, we've had factories before there was Barack Obama, uh, uh, hard as it, that is to believe. You know, and uh, we, we've had less of it since he came in. Okay, Tom, so let's, let me ask this question, which is politically incorrect, which makes it all the more important to ask. Some component of the voting public voted for him last time around as an act of national expiation yeah. because it, they felt, and I, I frankly, I, can, I could feel it myself. We were all proud, that even those of us who supported the opponent, we all felt proud the following day that the United States of America, uh, the Constitution takes slavery into account, the Civil War, but finally we have a black man as president of the United States. All right, that's perfectly understandable. We, under, we know that took place. Four years later, what about the argument that it is so important for him to get this right, so important as, as a continuation of this national act of expiation and healing and so forth, that in some way it's only right to give him, frankly, more slack than you might... Affirmative action for presidents. Well, there you go. I suppose that's what it amounts to. I guess you don't buy that one. Well, when you realize that the President of the United States has the lives of 300 million people in his hands, he has the future of Western civilization in his hands, uh, uh, he has the freedom that has been inherited over the centuries in his hands, 
and he's already starting to dismantle that. Uh, I really don't think this, it's a question of any individual, whoever's in the White House, being cut any slack. The last thing you need to do is cut slack to people who have power over 300 million other people. I think that when one uh, makes a profound change in a society, arousing enormous passions across the board, uh, that the burden of proof should be on those who think that this is beneficial. Because I have been listening very carefully and you have, have yet to hear the benefit to disadvantaged blacks that has been empirically discovered after affirmative action. Well, how quickly do you expect the changes? You know, we're impatient as a people. In fact, as I understand one of well, your... we've had dramatic changes in the other direction, Mr. Cashman. For instance, oh, but I the, attribute the, the, them the to, other cha to other causes, you say. Sex. I, yeah. I attribute the effects to other causes, largely to the economic disorders of the 1970s. Uh, the problems have been of long standing in our society. The remedy if, of affirmative action is a novel one. The University of California, when it presented a, uh, an affirmative action plan, proposed to make about half a dozen women and blacks full professors in about 20 years, as I recall the program. Uh, there were various fractions of people who would have become things in various periods of time. Various what? Various fractions. They would uh, add 3.5 more women and things like that, and I was always fascinated. I, I had some suggestions that the people I thought would be uh, right for the 0.5, but uh, these suggestions were not uh, well received. <laughs> <laughs> No, but it's, it's fascinating that you, see, I see this happening in all sorts of issues from Federal Reserve policies on across the board, that you say, this here's this wonderful program, and it will do wonderful things, and the burden of proof is on others to show that it will not do those things, and no matter how long it's been going on. It's not long enough. The, it, it, it's, it's never long enough. If it failed, it, was, it just wasn't enough commitment. The budget wasn't big enough, should have had a larger staff, wider powers, but there is never any sense of a burden of proof on you to say, when you've made this change that has caused such furor in this country and has gotten people at each other's throats, including people who have been allies in the past, such as blacks and the Jews, mm -hmm. there is never any sense of a need for you to advance the empirical evidence to support what you've been doing. Oh, on the contrary, Dr. Sal, I'm perfectly willing to have other people collect the empirical evidence. That's not my bag. Uh, but I'm, per <laughs> I'm perfectly happy to, uh, to, to subject the affirmative uh, action policies to reasonable statistical evaluation given uh, a sufficient period. Well, what is a sufficient, because you said for a bit, and now we're talking about a sufficient period, and, and, and I have difficulty with these. Uh, well, what temporal units are we talking I about? Would say Centuries, I, uh, I would decades? think centuries, decades? I would think of 20 to 25 years as a reasonable period because we're talking, after all, among other things, about the progress of just hired law firm associates uh, up to the grandeur of partners Wait, mo most, bla so most blacks on. are not about to become law firm associates. The real problem is the kid in the South Bronx right. who has a tough time getting his first job as an unskilled worker because the employer is scared to hire him because if he doesn't work out and he fires him, he may have to deal with the NAACP, with the EEOC, and God knows who else. Oh, I have so... That's I have so simple a remedy of, for that, Mr. Sal. Oh, I'm happy to share it. All we need to do is to revert to the goals of the Humphrey Hawkins Balanced <laughs> Growth and Full Employment Act. Gee, and then why employed, didn't I think of that? Ah, <laughs> uh, well, that's because you were tired from talking earlier. But uh, <laughs> if, uh, if, in fact, uh, if in fact we ran the economy at very high levels of employment, employers would ha be less picky, less choosy, as they were during the Second World War. I don't advocate World War III as a solution to the problem, good, good. but it is uh, nevertheless... It shall, is I, shall I answer the Humphrey Hawkins thing? What Humphrey Hawkins represents is doing what we've done in the public schools, promoting people along just because of you know, it's time for them to be promoted or passed along. Mm -hmm. And now, instead of confining this to the educational system, in which it's been a total disaster, we're now going to extend this into the marketplace so that people will be hired, regardless of other kinds of considerations, uh, and passed along. That at no point 
will they be forced to meet any kind of standards? Portugal has Humphrey Hawkins. Does they? And the highest per capita debt in the world. Well, you know, let me hawk back. Only nine years. They didn't even take 25 years. I see. Let me <laughs> hawk back to World War II, where I have the advantage of chronological antiquity to help not, me. Not that I can much, recall really. it. Uh, the fact is that during the Second World War, 13 million people were in uniform. I among them, by invitation of a group of my neighbors. And uh, at the same time as we supported a massive military effort, we actually improved the civilian standard of life during the Second World War. Now, how did we do it? We drew into the labor force all kinds of people who had been regarded as unemployable for assorted reasons, good and indifferent, bad perhaps, but it turned out that when there was a shortage of people instead of a shortage of jobs, employers became ingenious. All right, let, let, me, let, me, let me take that point, you see, because I have made the argument, you see, that the minimum wage law uh, tends to make it tougher for minorities to be employed. Then, by extension, one would say, conversely, a maximum wage law would make it easier. And what we had in World War II was a maximum wage law. And therefore, we had price and wage controls. And therefore, we had a chronic shortage of labor across the board. And under those conditions, uh, women, minorities, et cetera, were hired in unusual rates. So I'm happy to see you agreeing with the uh, paradigm that I was taught uh, at Chicago, that indeed, the number of jobs and people and so forth are all functions of price. Chicago has had a malignant influence. Uh, Not nearly as much as it should have. Uh, <laughs> it's, also, it's also true that after the war, there were 9% uh, black teenagers unemployed, and now that figure is more like 40%. Uh, and that's supposed to be after 40 years of progress under your system. Uh, given a choice, would you rather have uh, private price setters or public price setters in markets which are less than competitive? Well, since I have not seen these uh, enormous numbers of private price setters that you and uh, Professor Galbraith have been discovering for so many years, despite having read uh, your books on this subject, uh, I really have nothing to compare. Well, where I see prices set, I see them set by the government. Only? Really? I'd be, occasionally a few electrical co contractors get together and they end up, uh, 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 you know. But it's in, against in, the law. It's against, it's against yeah. the law. They get on a state rig against the law. How we call it criminal. That's right. That's right. I mean, we, we have laws against murder, but murders take place anyway. How do you interpret uh, the behavior of the major automobile producers in 1979 and 1980, dreadful sales years. In both of those years, General Motors and its colleagues raised automobile prices. This is not how they do it on 7th Avenue when the Garmin business is bad. I, I am tempted to say that after 25 years of that, I'll be happy to give you my answer, since presumably this is the magic number from which we do our empirical studies. Uh, and that like you, I haven't bothered to keep up with the automobile industry. Uh, and I'll wait 25 years for you if you'll wait 25 <coughs> years Oh, it'll be me. a wonderful, <laughs> it's something to look forward to. Well, I, 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 I think one obvious commentary is a lot of few pure, pure people bought cars. <laughs> And al also, there was automatic indexation of wages. Yes, uh, uh, I, I must say the thing that, that uh, Galbraith strikes me as uh, his, his theories in general is, is showing the, the utter imperviousness to empirical data. That the affluent society told us that we reached a level of affluence at which income distribution questions were no longer going to be important. Mm -hmm. We then ended upon a quarter of a century of the most intense interest in income distribution questions in the history of the United States. Uh, he informed us about the in industries of the country that now we had corporations that were immortal uh, and that really didn't obey the, the rules laid down in such terrible places as Chicago because they were invulnerable to the marketplace. Half of them went bankrupt. W.T. Grant <laughs> got wiped out. Uh, the Graflex Corporation used to supply 80% of all press cameras. They are now nowhere to be seen on the landscape. Uh, neither would Chrysler be anywhere on the landscape but for the intervention in which uh, so many liberals joined. Uh, you know, empirical evidence does matter. It does. I see less of it than you do. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to believe that because you've said so. I've, I've been asking you for it and I haven't gotten any of it. So I'm, I'm perfectly willing to agree uh, with you on that. But so, uh, we have one minute. The major piece of empirical evidence that I think you've cited uh, this hour 
has really been the contrast between the 60s and the 70s. And no, I, it's been the contrast I between well-off people and, poor, and badly off people. And that's true in other countries as well, that in Malaysia, where they've had affirmative action for the same amount of time, it's had the same results. It has done nothing for the poor Malays. The lowest level of Malays receive a smaller percentage of all the income received by Malays today than before this program, than before this program was put into effect as is true of blacks in the United is States. Is it worthless to do something for anybody but the very poor? I would like to see the well-off take care of themselves. If they can't, who can? At the heart of the affirmative action approach is the notion that statistical disparities show discrimination. No dogma has taken a deeper hold with less evidence, or in the face of more massive evidence to the contrary. A recent story in the Wall Street Journal revealed that more than four-fifths of all the donut shops in California are owned by Cambodians. That is about the same proportion as blacks among basketball stars. Clearly, neither of these disparities is due to discrimination against whites. Nor are such disparities new or peculiar to the United States. In medieval Europe, most of the inhabitants of the towns in Poland and Hungary were neither Poles nor Hungarians. In 19th century Bombay, most of the shipbuilders were Parsis, a minority in Bombay, and less than 1% of the population of India. In 20th century Australia, most of the fishermen in the port of Fremantle came from two villages in Italy. In southern Brazil, whole industries were owned by people of German ancestry, and such crops as tomatoes and tea have been grown predominantly by people of Japanese ancestry. Page after page, if not book after book, could be filled with similar statistical disparities from around the world and down through history. Such disparities have been the rule, not the exception. Yet our courts have turned reality upside down and treated what happens all over this planet as an anomaly and what is seldom found anywhere, proportional representation, as a norm. Why are such disparities so common? Because all kinds of work require particular skills, particular experience, particular locations, and particular orientations, and none of these things is randomly distributed. Local demagogues who thunder against the fact that Koreans run so many stores in black ghettos merely betray their ignorance when they act as if this were something strange or unusual. For most of the merchants in an area to be of a different race or ethnicity from their customers has been common for centuries in Southeast Asia, Eastern Europe, West Africa, the Caribbean, Fiji, the Ottoman Empire, and numerous other places. When German and Jewish merchants moved into Eastern Europe in the Middle Ages, they brought with them much more experience in that occupation than that possessed by local Eastern European merchants, who were often wiped out by the new competition. Even when the competition takes place between people who are racially and ethnically identical, all kinds of historical, geographical, and other circumstances can make one set of these people far more effective in some activities than the others. Mountain people have often lagged behind those on the plains below whether Highland Scots versus Lowland Scots, or the Sinhalese in the highlands of Sri Lanka versus the Sinhalese on the plains. The Slavs living along the Adriatic coast in ports like Dubrovnik were for centuries far more advanced than Slavs living in the interior, just as coastal peoples have tended to be more advanced than peoples of the interior hinterlands in Africa or Asia. Some disparities, of course, have their roots in discrimination. But the fatal mistake is to infer discrimination whenever the statistical disparities exceed what can be accounted for by random chance. Human beings are not random. They have very pronounced and complex cultural patterns. These patterns are not unchanging, but changing them for the better requires first acknowledging that human capital is crucial to economic advancement. Those who make careers out of attributing disparities to the wickedness of other people are an obstacle to the development of more human capital among the poor. There was a time, as late as the mid-19th century, when Japan lagged far behind the Western industrial nations because it was lacking in the kind of human capital needed in a modern economy. Importing Western technology was not enough for the Japanese lacked the knowledge and experience required to operate it effectively. 
Japanese workmen damaged or ruined machinery when they tried to use it. Fabrics were also ruined when the Japanese tried to dye them without understanding chemistry. Whole factories were badly designed and had to be reconstructed at great cost. What saved the Japanese was that they recognized their own backwardness and worked for generations to overcome it. They did not have cultural relativists to tell them that all cultures are equally valid or political activists to tell them that their troubles were all somebody else's fault, nor were there guilt-ridden outsiders offering them largesse. Affirmative action has been one of the great distractions from the real task of self-development. When it and the mindset that it represents passes from the scene, poorer minorities can become the biggest beneficiaries if their attention and efforts turn toward improving themselves. Unfortunately, a whole industry of civil rights activists, politicians, and miscellaneous hustlers has every vested interest in promoting victimhood, resentment, and paranoia instead.